Hey guys, welcome back to another True Crime Thursday. Today I'm going to be talking about The Boy in the Box. Now this story is quite short and BuzzFeed Unsolved went over this case, but I kind of wanted to talk about it in case you haven't seen their series. And it's just a very interesting and weird case, even if it is short. So this video will not be in the normal length of like 20 to 30 minutes. It may only be 10 for all I know. But let's get into the story. In February of 1957, the boy's body was found wrapped in a plaid blanket in the woods off of Susquehanna Road in Fox Chase, Philadelphia. The naked body was inside a cardboard box which had once contained a bassinet sold by J.C. Penney. The boy's hair had been recently chopped, possibly after death, as clumps of hair still clung to the body. There were signs of severe malnourishment as well as surgical scars on the ankle, groin, and a L-shaped scar under the chin. The boy was first discovered by a young man who was checking his muskrat traps. Uh, fearing the police would confiscate his traps, he just left it there. He just left the boy's body there. Like, oh, my traps are going to get taken. I'm going to not tell anyone. A few days later, a college student spotted a rabbit running into the underbrush. Knowing that there were animal traps in the area, he stopped his car to investigate and discovered the body. He too was reluctant to tell the police, but he did report what he saw the following day. The police received the report and opened an investigation on February 26, 1957. The dead boy's fingerprints were taken, and given that the boy was young between the ages of 3 and 7, Police were optimistic that he would be identified. However, once they saw the body, their hopes were dashed. While people would surely be looking for a healthy, well-taken-care-of, clearly-loved boy, most would not look for a malnourished, scrawny, dirty one. The case attracted mass media attention in Philadelphia and the Delaware Valley. The Philadelphia Inquirer printed 400,000 flyers depicting the boy's likeness, which was sent out and posted across the area and were included with every gas bill in Philadelphia. The crime scene was combed over and over again by 270 police academy recruits, who discovered a man's blue corduroy cap, a child's scarf, and a man's white handkerchief with the letter G. The police also distributed a postmortem photograph of the boy fully dressed and in a seated position as he may have looked in life in the hope it may lead to a clue. Despite the publicity and sporadic interest throughout the years, the boy's identity still is unknown. On March 21st, 2016, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children released a forensic facial reconstruction of the victim and added him into their database. In August of 2018, Barbara Ray Venter, the genetic genealogist who helped to identify the Golden State Killer using a DNA profiling technique, said that she was using the same method to try to identify the boy in the box. Amateur groups that use the online databases such as the Doe Network and Web Sleuths have also tried to solve his identity, and so far, no one has found out who this boy was and where he was from. Now that's the base of the story. They found his body, they tried to figure out who he was, and then that was it. They never found who he was. But we're going to go over some theories as to what people may believe what happened. There are two main theories, and there's a few stragglers. One of the first, more prominent theories is that he was from a foster home. The theory concerns a foster home that was located approximately one and a half miles from the site of the body. In 1960, Remington Bristow, an employee of the medical examiner's office who doggedly pursued the case until his death in 1993, contacted a New Jersey psychic who told him to look for a house that matched the description of the foster home. When the psychic was brought to the Philadelphia discovery site, she led him straight there. Now, do I believe in psychics? Honestly, I don't know. But that's a little creepy. If she didn't know where it was, it's a little creepy. Upon attending a estate sale at the foster home, Remington discovered a bassinet similar to the one sold at JCPenney. He also discovered blankets hanging on the clothesline that were quite similar to the one the boy was wrapped in. Remington believed that the boy belonged to the stepdaughter of the man who ran the foster home and that they disposed of his body so the stepdaughter would not be exposed as an unwed, unwed mother. 
Despite this circumstantial evidence, the police were not able to find many de definite links between the boy in the box and the foster family. In 1998, Philadelphia Police Lieutenant Tom Augustine, who was in charge of the investigation, and several members of the VDOC Society, a group of retired policemen and profilers, interviewed the foster father and the stepdaughter. The foster home investigation was closed, so I don't know if they didn't find anything, but they didn't. F if they did find something, they didn't find enough to do anything about it, so just closed. Another theory was brought forward in February of 2002 by a woman identified only as Martha. Police considered Martha's story to be plausible, but they were tr troubled by her testimony as she had a history of mental illness. So, yeah. M claimed that her abusive mother had purchased the unknown boy, whose name was Jonathan, from his birth parents in the summer of 1954. Subsequently, the boy was subjected to extreme physical and sexual abuse for two and a half years. Uh, one evening at dinner, the boy vomited up his meal of baked beans and was given a severe beating with his head slammed against the floor until he was un semi conscious. So he's like, they beat him really hard. He was given a bath during which he died because, you know, he's a little kid and you're beating his head against the floor. These details matched information that only the police knew, as the coroner had found the boy's stomach contained the remains of baked beans and that his fingers were water wrinkled. M's mother cut the boy's distinctive long hair, accounting for the unprofessional haircut, which police noted, in an effort to conceal his identity. M's mother forced M to assist her in dumping the boy's body in the fox chase area. M said that as they were preparing to remove the boy's body from the trunk, a male motorist pulled alongside to inquire if they needed help. M was ordered to stand in front of the license plate so he couldn't get a good view of it, as the mother tried to convince him that everything was fine, and eventually he drove off. The story corroborated co confidential testimony by a male witness in 1957 who said that the boy had been placed in a box previously discarded at the scene. In spite of the outward possibility of M's confession, police were unable to verify her story. Neighbors who had access to M's house during the stated time period denied that there had been a young boy there and dismissed M's claims as ridiculous. But you never know. If you're hiding a boy and abusing him, you really think you're going to show it off to people? It's quite possible that he was hidden in the basement, or it's a complete lie. I don't know. Now, here are a few other possibilities that are not as researched, but could be plausible. So, one of the minor theories is that the boy was raised as a girl. Uh, forensic artist Frank Bender developed a theory that the victim may have been raised as a girl. The child's unprofessional haircut, which appeared to have been performed in haste, was the basis for the scenario, as well as the appearance of the eyebrows, which looked styled. In 2008, Bender released a sketch of the unidentified child with long hair, reflecting strands found on the body. The next theory is sex trafficking, which is never, never a good thing. The child was a victim of human trafficking who was purchased by a local couple to be used for sex, a premise that comes from a woman known by the pseudonym Mary, who claims to be the couple's daughter and to have witnessed some of the horrors endured by the boy. She reported that her mother beat the child to death as she was giving him a bath after he had thrown up a meal of baked beans. Mary then accompanied her mother to a remote spot where the woman placed the boy in a cardboard box and left. But there's not enough evidence to support it. Another one is a missing brother. A man who reported to the Philadelphia Police Department that his older half-brother had gone missing around the same time period that the boy had. He said his sibling's disappearance was a longtime family secret and that a hypothetical bust of the boy in the box's father created by forensic sculptor Frank Bender looked like his own father, now dead. No connection was ever made, but I'm just, that's a little sketch. Look into it, even if it's small. Look into it, it could be right. In 2016, two writers, one from Los Angeles, California, Jim Hoffman, and the other from New Jersey, Louis Romano, explained that they believe that they discovered a potential identity from Memphis, Tennessee, and requested that DNA be compared between the family members and the child. 
The weed was originally discovered by a Philadelphia man who introduced Romano and Hoffman to each other and was developed and presented with the help of Hoffman to the Philadelphia Police Department and the VDOC Society in early 2013. In December 2013, Romano became aware of the lead and agreed to help the man from Philadelphia and Hoffman to obtain the DNA from this particular family member in January of 2014. This sample was quickly sent to the Philadelphia, Philadelphia Police Department. Local authorities confirmed that they would investigate the lead but said they would need to do more research on the circumstances surrounding the link to Memphis before comparing DNA. In December of 2017, Homicide Sergeant Bob Colmeyer confirmed that the DNA taken from Memphis man was compared to the Fox Chase boy and there was no connection. In the end, the boy was buried with an unknown name. The boy in the box was originally buried in a potter's field. In 1998, the body was exhumed for the purpose of extracting DNA, which was obtained from the enamel in one of his teeth. He was reburied at Ivy Hill Cemetery in Cedarbrook, Philadelphia. The coffin, headstone, and funeral service were donated by the son of the man who had buried the boy in 1957. There was significant public attendance and the media coverage at the reburial, and the grave has a large headstone bearing the words, America's Unknown Child. City residents keep the grave decorated with flowers and stuffed animals. To conclude, this story is really short and it's kind of just sad because there are is literally nothing. There's no details. They found a boy in a box. They know what he looks like. They couldn't even pinpoint his exact age, so between three and seven. No one knows his name. No one knows where he's from. He was left alone. A little boy. And he had scars and he was malnourished and probably abused dramatically. And it's it's heartbreaking because no one knows who he is. And I hope one day that, that someone comes forward and bees and says that's my brother or I think my mom might have done something or my dad or this or that and we find out the identity of him because someone knows who this is and they just don't want to admit it to the world because maybe they did something horrible by now they're probably dead so it could be a son or a grandkid or daughter or whatever that could come forward and be like my mom did something or my dad did something or whatever i don't know i just feel like someone knows who this kid is and they just won't tell anyone i mean this happened in 1957 it is 2020 and no one knows who this boy is he was originally buried in a potter's field which is like not the best place to be buried and then he got his own grave and it's pretty large and people leave toys and stuffed animals and that's really sweet and awesome that people are caring enough to leave toys for him but it just sucks that we don't actually know his name we don't know his exact age we don't know where he's from we don't know his name we don't know anything about this boy literally nothing because this case is so old it's highly unlikely that it could ever be solved i really want it to be but the longer the time passes, the less likely the people that were around during that time are alive. I highly doubt the person who did this is alive anymore. So I really hope that they have family that may be like, huh, and question something and come forward. If you do, go to the Philadelphia police, wherever this happened. If I can find a number or something for you to contact, I'll put it in the description below. If not, just do a little bit of research, and if you know who the boy is, come forward, because the boy deserves to have a name. No one deserves to die without being known. No one deserves to just be another body. Next week is the beginning of October, which is spooky month. I'm doing a ton of spooky stuff on my TikTok. I'm doing Gortober, because that is where I do a different creepy makeup look every day uh, for the entirety of October. I did it last year. And I'm going to try and do it again. A few of the topics I chose are the same. But I'm going to try and do it a little more. Uh, I'm going to try to do it differently. Maybe a little better. Some are different. But we will see. And I'm going to be doing uh, Halloween-y type like, true crime. Like supernatural type stuff. And I'm going to try and do like uh, spooky videos for my other videos as well. I haven't decided what I'm going to do yet. But uh, yeah, it should be fun. I hope you guys enjoy. Uh, I will see you next Thursday with another True Crime Thursday and Monday with whatever I decide to post. Alright, bye guys.